I have a yeah. so We're going to give you the first question. Okay, 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 here you go. Hello, Dave, can you hear me? Yeah, Hi. My point is that you talk about people who have the power, and in a small sense, I do have. I'm the managing editor of the local BBC radio station here on Teesside, and in January we'll be starting up one of the community websites that you mentioned in your lecture. Um, I think it is a bit ambitious to try and cure all the ills of society. Um, I would tend to agree with you on that. But if we do have to have a factor X that would make the website successful to people on Teesside who, let's face it, don't have a, a lot going for them, there's an awful lot of deprived areas in this area, what one thing do you think we should have? I think if you can find a way to, to ask the people on Teesside what their answer to that question is, <laughs> then you've got a beginning. Not only because they are obviously the ones to tell you what their most important problems are, some of which may be addressable, some of which may not be soluble. If you have a disease, you probably need medicine and other communication technology. Uh, but not only because uh, they are the, the people who know what the problems are that are most important to them, but from the beginning, you make it clear to them that they not only have a voice, but and shape what you're doing. I think if I can generalize about it, to think of ways to enable the people uh, in your community to shape uh, how uh, you communicate, you will find that their enthusiasm and their capability are Oh. Thank you very much. It's up to them, in other words. Well, I think it's up to them to yeah, it's up to them to discuss it. I think that you can't uh, assume that every suggestion is going to be a good one, but I think that if you take input from people and implement what you think is the best idea and the most doable idea, you will find that they don't you know, are listening to them. You don't have to turn to total control over it. You know, there is a key for uh, professional uh, experience uh, when you're talking about radio, uh, but I, I think that when the word gets around it, that people have listened to, particularly the people who don't go down and have a voice, and they are going to enlist the enthusiasm of the community. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Hello, you're speaking to Trevor Pitt from Jubilee Arts. Um, as, a, as an artist who works with communities, you come up and said about artists leading the way, which obviously is quite exciting to hear. Um, how, 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 what suggestions or what thoughts do you have about mobilising that support for artists who are working in a kind of like a new, not a new arena, because there being lots of digital artists, but a new kind of arena? Well, I think uh, this is one of the, the questions that I think has a, uh, a pretty viable answer. Uh, I'm an artist myself, but I, I paint, uh, but I'm not a, a very, um, I haven't exhibited, I, I don't know any gallery owners. I learned how to put my paintings up on my website and found it to be very gratifying. Just the simple act of showing someone how to take their art and make it available on the web so that millions of people around the world can see it, and make it possible for some of those people to perhaps send them an email, is I know from personal experience, immensely empowering. So I guess uh, to summarize, if you can make it available for people uh, to display what you do and show them very simply how to do that, uh, that's a great beginning. It just enlists enormous enthusiasm, particularly for people who don't expect very many people to see their art. Hello, Howard. It's Brian Loder here. Um, thanks very much indeed for the forward that you provided to the book <laughs> this evening uh, that Luke uh, that Hebel and I uh, and edited, um, and uh, he checks in the post. <laughs> some people suggest that, that virtual communities uh, are in some way a, a threat to real communities, that they, that they diminish social capital. Have you got a kind of like uh, soundbite response to that? <laughs> Well, you know, I've, uh, throughout uh, this, I've tried to, to emphasize that technology uh, 
does not have agency of its own, that technology uh, depends upon how people use it. And I think it is quite possible for people to escape from the problems of their daily life and pretend that they are really engaging in community enterprise by having flame wars online and not getting involved in their local school district or voting for their local elections. And that it is entirely possible for people to mobilize others who might not otherwise be able to come to a meeting to use uh, an online discussion just to make ways that they wouldn't be able to do before. Uh, just a simple example, for most people, we have to get our kids off to school and go to work and come home from work and get them on the table, and we don't have time to go to a meeting every night. But we might go to a meeting once a month and check in on, uh, online every night, and I think it does. I don't think it's a simple virtual communities are bad or virtual communities are good. I think it really depends on how we use them. What's exciting to me about uh, community informatics and community networks is that it, it shows people using the online medium as one of uh, many uh, tools and practices for engaging the people they live with locally. And while we can talk about lots of things uh, on the international level, right now I think what's important is how can you use what's happening uh, online uh, to enhance what's happening in your neighborhood. And I, I hope that's a that's a, a quick practical That's a great answer. Good. Yeah, that's a great answer. I do have a much longer... No, no, then we, have, we, have, <laughs> we have other guests here that, that we're keen to, to bring in. Thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, uh, hello, Howard. Thank you very much for coming and speaking to us today. Uh, my name is Chris Hayden. I run Community TV Trust in London. I wanted to ask you about the issue of control, which you addressed a couple of times in your talk. Um, you, you accented on our uh, taking up the opportunity to organize. You mentioned, of course, the powers of control that vested interests and authorities have and always seek to exercise in, it seems, ever increasing ways. And there's a bit of a tension in here for you, of course, because you say at the end that you remain fundamentally an optimist. Um, because of events in the last 48 hours or so, some people feel the world is now definitely changed. Chris Yap of the ICL uh, is a speaker that we know well over here. Have you come across him yourself, sir? No, I don't. Right. Uh, uh, he, he's um, very active and a leading thinker. Mm -hmm. He feels that a government act over here that is called the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, RIP Act, which the British government has passed to enable it to access all email traffic and electronic traffic, uh, he believes it's fundamentally <coughs> unworkable. Have you uh, anything to say on this sphere of government enactment of controlling mechanisms? Well, clearly, we, we, because of uh, terrorism, uh, we are in a different world. <coughs> we are in a world in America where means of surveillance that were unthinkable and would have been opposed by many people a few hours ago are now uh, probably going to be demanded Right now. Uh, clearly, physical safety, knowing that when you send your children off to school, they're going to come home, uh, is foremost in people's mind. The danger is always uh, to a democratic society that in times of crisis, uh, civil authorities will take advantage of the situation to advocate civil liberties. Sometimes, as in wartime, that's, that's necessary. The question is, do we get those liberties back uh, when uh, the war is over? If the war is not over, uh, what kind of society do we become? I know certainly those are questions that Americans are asking ourselves right now. And in terms of whether it's unworkable for authorities to use technical means 
England, I'll say two things. One is that there's an enormous amount of information overloads, and there aren't uh, enough human analysts to sift all of the intercepted communications to determine what to do about it, for good or for evil. Uh, only the, the very few most important issues are going to be able to be uh, addressed in the technical means of surveillance. And the second thing I'll have to say is that technological capabilities are evolving extremely rapidly. Uh, we now have cameras that are connected to computers that can recognize faces from databases. And you can put one of those cameras up at, uh, at every train station and have a list of uh, known uh, wanted uh, criminals, whether they are criminals or people who disagree with the state, um, and automatically recognize them as flag. So I, I think there's not a cut and dried answer to that. I think that governments and law enforcement and intelligence agencies know that they are at the human limit of what they can do with information overloading and are increasingly turning to technical means. And of course, uh, George Orwell wrote about that a long time ago. Are we moving into a world in which uh, technical means of surveillance are going to control our lives? You know, there are some people who believe that uh, technical means of surveillance are inevitable. And that what we need is not to try to stop it, but to make it more symmetrical. So that it's not only the authorities who can surveil the citizens, but the citizens can surveil each other and, to some degree, the authorities. There is a book written by an American called David Brin, called The Transparent Society, in which he makes that case. And I'm not sure how much I agree with him, but I think this issue of symmetry if we're going to be surveilled, how much access do we citizens have to those means of surveillance, to surveil each other, um, are we going to have? <coughs> we need to have a public sphere in which we can talk about these issues because politically and technically we're really only at the beginning of the era of te technological surveillance. Thank you for that full answer. I'll pass you back to Steve. Okay, we have another question, Howard. Right. Hello, my name is Marion Scott and I'm a freelance consultant. You talked about the importance of the internet and other forms of digital communication being important for building civil society. And you spoke about the need to talk about day-to-day -day problems, to communicate with each other and to arbitrate differences. I was wondering whether you thought that the internet was helping in an area where uh, much is unspoken, much is uncomfortable, and that is in the area of gender relations, in the area of power relations between men and women, in home life, in work life, in the community. Whether we were getting more visibility, more communication, and more arbitration of the differences, which is definitely needed. Gender relations, um, you know, it's, uh, like many issues, a, a complex and, and volatile issue, and one in which we're only really beginning to, to learn something about. I think uh, there are some hopeful signs. Uh, one of the characteristics of online media is that quite often you don't know the gender or the race or the age of the person you're communicating with. And this can be a tremendous advantage. And so many people whose voices might not have been heard, might have been because of the gender, um, more visible, give them more of a voice than they had before. I think there are disadvantages to uh, not being able to see uh, people and uh, hear the tone of voice. Uh, it's a rather different discussion. But uh, I think we're, we've also seen, uh, five years ago, uh, there were discussions about how male the internet is. And I think 10 years ago, we would say we're united. Are, are using the internet. That in itself 
again, is not going to solve problems. People need to address the problems and communicate about them. And again, uh, I would emphasize that I think that there are good things that can be done about uh, a lot of very volatile discussions, whether it's about politics or gender or race, are difficult to do face to Different kinds of body language, different kinds of facial expressions are interpreted differently by different groups. And to shape um, the way in which the internet develops, and particularly um, the fact that a small number of people with a bit of vision can actually make um, some big things happen. And I'd like to invite you to participate in something that began in Europe last uh, November. Um, three people, one, one from the UK, one from France, and one from Spain, got together and um, brought, uh, or developed a, a conference which brought together 700 community networkers from 34 countries and all of the continents to address you know, many of the issues that you raised about access, about privacy, democracy, sustainable development and so on. And out of that there was a um, global community networking partnership has developed and there will be another conference in Buenos Aires in December. Um, and I think it's uh, in terms of the issues that you've been raising here, I think it's something that you would you know, be interested in participating in, I mean either actually or virtually. Um, and certainly it's a, a mechanism, I think, for uh, helping us share our interests across developed and developing countries and um, in a way that is driven from the bottom up, but in partnership with local authorities, uh, regional agencies and so on. So I just wanted to draw your attention to that. Um, I hope you'd be interested in finding out a bit more, which I can send you. Um, and we'd be delighted to uh, have some involvement one way or the other. Uh, I, I would also be glad to help in whatever way I can, and uh, I'm sure that, that Steve or uh, Neil can uh, tell you how to get in touch with me, and uh, I'm glad to hear that this is happening in Buenos Aires. Uh, we need to engage more and more of the Southern Hemisphere in this, in, in this dialogue. And I know simply by the email I'm getting, people who are joining uh, the virtual communities that I participate in, that more and more people in you know, uh, uh, Certainly Brazil, um, Argentina, and Venezuela are, are beginning to come online. Next, uh, next question is coming up. Thank you, Howard. It's Steve Thompson again. Um, I think we've run out of questions now, um, Just uh, so I think we're about ready to close. I'd just like to say, finally, if you recall, <coughs> it's nearly a year ago that you appeared at the Team Vikings online launch. And uh, you said you'd come and check us out in a year's time. So. I'm terribly disappointed that you weren't able to be here physically, but also I think it's fantastic that we've yeah. used technology to link this up and go ahead almost as if you were here. Um, we look forward to seeing you sometime in the future. I, I hope so, and, and I thank you uh, wholeheartedly for the, uh, your perseverance today. You know, uh, like many other people in America, I've just been somewhat hypnotized and unable to, to do anything. I, I, I certainly can't get to the airport and uh, being able to use communication technology to overcome the obstacles and to talk about how communication technology uh, can overcome the obstacles has awakened uh, me and uh, brought a little bit more hope into, into my life. So I, I thank you as well. Thank you very much, Al. Great when it works. <laughs>
I think uh, the two technicians that worked so hard on that, Jill and uh, Nina, deserve a round of applause. Deputy Vice Chancellor, because there can't be too many days in her life that somebody marches into her office and says, "Oh, that's amazing! Pull the phone out, make it work." 